Welcome to Lesson 6, Systematic Theology. Uh, this week's lesson is on anthropology and harmodiology, the study of man and sin. We've been on a journey going through a number of the topics in systematic theology, and really this is an introduction to systematic theology. So far we've covered uh, bibliology, the study of the Bible, theology proper, the study of God, pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit, soteriology, the study of salvation, and ecclesiology, the study of the church. Uh, tonight, as we enter into uh, the study of man and sin, we really have to explore some things that I think sometimes are big enough topics that we want to put them aside. And so we have to think about who we are, um, maybe even think about who uh, we really are compared to kind of the perception of, uh, of who we are as, as both ourselves and as, as uh, humanity in general. And then we have to compare that to, um, or try to reconcile that with um, the view of our world, uh, particularly the view of uh, good and evil and how we reconcile uh, what we see. So that's a challenge for us tonight. <clears throat> and to start that challenge off, I want to go to Psalm 8. Um, because I think David really gives us a hint here of um, a perspective that's helpful. And he starts out in Psalm 8 by uh, crying out, O Lord, O Lord, how excellent uh, is your name in all the earth. And you've set your glory on or above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and unweaned infants you have established strength because of your foes, that you might silence the enemies and the avenger. And when I view and consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've ordained and established, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? I'm going to stop there because uh, if we look at the perspective that David has, he in verse 3 here, he considers the heavens, what God has done, and the evidence of God in the creation, particularly in the moon and the stars. And then he looks at that, and he compares what he sees, and he compares it to himself. And he asks this profound question. <laughs> Lord, why do you, how could you even bother? Uh, how do you even know me? How do you, uh, the, the, the looking at the stars and the power that you express in your creation, how in a planet filled of nearly 7 billion people now can you even identify who I am? How do you even spend time thinking about me? <clears throat> and you don't just think about me, but you care for me. Um, and, and so we see in this um, view, uh, a, a view of God at the center, theocentric, not man at the center. And, and that tension that exists between who David sees himself to be, who he really is, uh, versus who we can at times think we are, um, the root of that tension is uh, rooted in our origins. Um, and, and in the study of anthropology or the doctrine of man, uh, we start that study with we're thinking about our origins, and, and we really break it down to two questions. Am I here by chance? And if I'm here by chance, if the universe evolved out of nothing, and it's uh, accident uh, that causes it to come into existence, and the evolution of life is a series of accidents, that result in my being here, what are the implications of that? Um, and, and you can extend that further uh, if life is a, a function of chance and I'm here um, by accident and by, by if I were to carry that forward to say there's no purpose to it, then uh, am I at the center of things? Am, am, is my existence at the center of things? Or, uh, from an origin standpoint, am I the created in the image of God, which is the uh, expression that is laid out by God in the explanation in Genesis? He created us in his image. And if that's true, then <clears throat> we're created beings in the image of God, but that puts God at the center of things. And 
I'm a participant in them, but I'm not the central focus of them. And so uh, you can see in Psalm 8, David had that right. He, he looked at the creation as an indication of the creator. And he says, Lord, you're so big and so amazing and so awesome. And how do you even spend time thinking about me or caring about me? But, but his relationship with God was God at the center. He, um, as a part, and he marveled at the uh, evidence that not just of the universe and the creation, but the care that the creator takes in, in not just the creation as a whole, but in him as a, as a person. Um, we can confuse uh, our origin um, by our emotion. We can think of ourselves largely as a function of our emotions. And um, the problem with that is that changes moment by moment. And so uh, I can feel great and I can be filled with self-worth and self-importance or I can feel depressed and I can be filled with self-worthlessness and self-doubt. And so uh, if I think about who I am, who I really am, um, and uh, I allow that thought to be motivated or driven by my emotions, then I'm going to be on for quite a roller coaster ride. I'm going to be up and down. Um, but the circumstances that are around me do not change who I really am. They don't change the nature of my uh, origin or existence. They don't change my character or my purpose as uh, a created being. Uh, how I react to them expresses who I am, but the circumstances really just act upon me. They don't change who I am. Um, but today, uh, I think it's easy for us. Uh, I know this happens for me often. It's easy for us to be controlled by my emotion and to not allow, not just allow that emotion to control me, but to uh, shape the thought of who I am. And so I think that's a danger. And I think we have to uh, be careful about allowing the circumstance and thus allowing our emotions to drive who we are and to not forget, uh, to, to not allow it, not allow the emotion or the circumstance to uh, uh, allow us to forget about the fact that we're created beings in the image of God, that like David, we look around at the creation and we see the majesty of the creation and the majesty of the creator and marvel at the fact that God knows us and he cares for us and uh, he desires us to be with him. And that's really the good news. The really good news here is our feelings don't determine who we are. Our feelings about God don't change his nature. So if I say to God, you don't exist, that doesn't change the fact that God does exist. He either is or he is not. My feelings about him really don't change his existence, nor do they change his nature. Um, uh, nor do they change the fact that we're created in God's image. So we're spiritual beings, meaning that we're meant to be in relationship with God for eternity. Um, and nothing about the circumstances or the emotions of our lives or the issues of our lives change that fact. The origin, the components of who I am, not just the physical material nature of my body, but the non-material spiritual nature of who I am. <clears throat> Um, understanding our origin and our true nature is the foundation for living lives as God is, as God intended. Um, and so that, that's the challenge for us is to have clarity on that origin and that true nature. Uh, but I struggle with that because I struggle with the idea that if I look around the world, how do I reconcile, uh, this idea, this marvel that David had of, of the, the, awesome nature of God and the fact that he cares for me. And then I see um, the circumstances, the things that I tend to react to, uh, and mostly the negative things, the things that are difficult for me to understand or explain. And, and so, the, so the study of man also has to be looked at with the study of sin and the problem of sin. Does the existence uh, of evil in the world confuse our outlook on life? Why does it exist? How does evil, how does evil's existence impact me? And, and I would start here, usually with the view 
that uh, I want to believe that I'm essentially good. And, uh, and I might even use that goodness, the things that I do, uh, the, that I point to or justify um, compared to others. So I'm better than, list the list of people that you would look around to use for justification and say, I'm better than them, so aren't I essentially good? And if God's grading on a scale, doesn't that mean that, you know, he should accept me as I am? Um, and, and when we studied soteriology and salvation, what we looked at really was the need to be saved. Why do I need to be saved? And so what we find there is our fallen nature. And that fallen nature is simply in rebellion to uh, the direction and to the commandments of God. And so that leads to separation. Anything that's not of God is sin. And so we end up with um, this uh, separation from God. And so the question really isn't, aren't you good? It's whether or not you're uh, uh, in relationship with God or, or have you been separated from him? And, and really, that's the separation in its heart is the existence of evil. So anything that's not of God is in separation from God and is at its heart in rebellion to God. And that rebellion, uh, we can look around and see all around the world. Uh, every uh, act that's done, that's done uh, in, in self-motivation, that's done in uh, self-purpose um, has a consequence, and those consequences either act upon the person themselves, so the things that I do, that I do, that are not of God, um, impact me, they hurt me, or they hurt others around me, and I've done plenty of that in my life, and I can see the, the evidence of that, and if I'm being honest with myself, um, I, the question of aren't I essentially good really goes away when I examine the things that I've done that are for me and by me and have hurt others, then I, I, I really begin to understand uh, the, uh, the, the ugliness, really, of being separated from God. And so the question of sin, um, uh, rather than trying to justify it, rather than trying to justify my actions, rather than trying to uh, explain why I'm good enough, why I make the list of you know, I don't know if you do, do this, but I uh, at times may look at the list of things that I've done well uh, and say, well, don't they outweigh the things that I've done um, poorly or hurtfully and try to hope that in the balance they balance out, but they don't. Um, the, the things that I've done well do not change the fact that there are things that I've done that cause separation. And once I'm separated, I need, um, not of my own, but I need to have that relationship restored, and it can only be restored in Jesus Christ. It can only be bridged by the God who came into the world so that man and God could be bridged back together. And so when we look at sin and God, we look at the context of the existence of God, we discover answers to many questions we have about evil. Uh, sin is anything that's not of God. Sin leads to separation from God. And that nature, which is inherited in Adam in the first act of sin, the original sin, results in a nature that's in rebellion to that which is of God. Um, and rebellion is the issue here. Um, we see that rebellion in the world. We see the direct consequences of that rebellion, uh, whether it acts upon myself when I'm in rebellion or it acts upon others. Um, we end up with a world that is fallen and broken and in need of repair. Um, and so when I go back to David and he is looking at God, he sees both the origin, the creator, and he sees himself in that creation in proper perspective. But he also sees God, the creator, in a caring, loving mode. And he is well aware that he's living in a fallen, evil world. Um, and he looks at God and marvels at him. God as well. God, what? How, how are you even mindful of me? Not just in the fact that I'm a small part of a gigantic creation, but I'm also a part of a fallen uh, aspect of the creation because it's in rebellion to you, and yet you care for me anyway, uh, and you love me, and uh, you haven't let me go. Uh, 
in that perspective, in David's perspective, we end up with uh, really uh, the foundation for us as human beings uh, created in God's image to be uh, in right relationship with him. And that's really where uh, uh, the doctrine of man and the doctrine of the study of sin need to get us to, that right foundation that leads us to uh, the opportunity for us to have the right perspective as we move forward in right relationship with God. So this week I offer you uh, uh, an opportunity to think about um, uh, your life, the opportunity to think about how you uh, fit in right perspective in relationship to God, how you fit uh, to not be controlled by the circumstances or the emotions uh, so that you have a clear understanding of who you are in relationship to God and that uh, the circumstances do not change who you are, and that you also look at uh, the evidence of sin around you and the real pain and the hurt that is caused by uh, that rebellion, whether it's been in your life or in the lives of those around you, uh, to also understand that uh, even through that pain and through that hurt, uh, God sees you and he cares for you and he loves you and that he surrounds you in that, um, and he wants to rescue you from that pain and that hurt. And so as we examine those in our lives, uh, uh, we uh, use that as the opportunity to cry out like David did, Lord, we're, how are you even mindful of me? How are you even aware of me? But, but Lord, I'm so thankful that you are, and I'm so grateful, Lord, that you, um, in the expanse of the universe, know not just my, not just me by name, Lord, but you know every hair on my head. Uh, you know me in an intimate way um, that, uh, Lord, gives me great confidence in moving forward in my life. So I, I lift that up um, to you this week, and I lift that up as a, an opportunity for you to reconnect as a child of the holy, true, and living God, as a created being in the image of God, uh, restored and renewed and refreshed to right relationship with him. Amen. And we'll be back next week with um, the study of uh, angels and uh, the study of um, eschatology will be the final week and then we'll begin preparing for finals and final papers. Thank you.